My introduction to the course, I mentioned that the goal of this course is not to get you to become a professional photographer, but more that you hone your skills at learning how to see and that you discover new ways of seeing. In order to do so, we're going to use the camera as a tool to help us do just that. Much like a painter and other artists translate what they see or imagine with paints and a paintbrush, photographers translate what they see or imagine with a camera. In the second series of lectures in this module, I'm going to talk about strategies for seeing, framing, and organizing visual information in such a way that yields a compelling photograph. But before I do that, I want to go through a few basic camera functions with you so that you can use your camera in the best way possible. This course does not require that you have a digital SLR camera, a digital single lens reflex, but some of you may, so this next bit is for you. A traditional film single lens reflex camera, or SLR camera, uses a mirror between the lens and the film to provide a focus screen. That means that the image you see looking through the viewfinder will be the same as what appears on film. A digital SLR uses an image sensor instead of film, but the basic mechanisms are more or less the same. A huge advantage of DSLRs over traditional film cameras is that they come programmed with modes, which basically do the math of shooting for you, choosing things like f-stop, shutter speed, and ISO. And these are all terms I'm going to cover in the next video. So you don't have to worry about it when you're shooting. Depending upon the make and model of your camera, there are likely thousands of online tutorials that combined with the owner's manual can help you with the specifics of your camera, but here's a general overview of the modes available. The best place to start is by learning your master shooting modes. You can generally find these on a dial that looks like this and is labeled Auto, AV, TV, P, and M. Many point-and-shoot digital cameras also have this type of dial, which makes it nice if you're learning how to navigate one of those. Selecting a shooting mode will determine how your camera behaves when you push the shutter. When you select Auto, for example, the camera will determine everything to do with the exposure, or the act of taking and recording a shot, including the aperture and the shutter speed. And again, I'm going to talk about those terms in the next video segment. All of the other modes are there to give you a little bit more control over how you take the shot. The first mode to know is Aperture Priority Mode, which is AV or A. You can think of this as a sort of semi-automatic shooting mode. When you choose this one, you select the aperture or the size of the opening behind the lens that allows light into the camera, and the camera will control the shutter speed, or how long the light is allowed into the camera. The shutter priority mode, which is TV or S, is next. Similar to aperture priority, this is another sort of semi-automatic shooting mode. In this case, you set the shutter speed and the camera adjusts the aperture as necessary. I'm going to talk about how shutter speed works in the next bit, and you'll learn how and why it is so important. Program mode, or P mode, is a sort of halfway point between either aperture priority or shutter priority. You can set either the aperture or the shutter and the camera will follow suit with the other. And manual mode, M, is exactly what it sounds like. You have full control over the exposure determination because you set both the aperture and the shutter speed. Many cameras have additional modes for specific situations like portraits, night shots, sport shots, etc. In these modes, the camera figures out the math of what we call the exposure triangle, or how the aperture, shutter speed, and ISO all work together. In the next video, I'm going to talk about that triangle and how you can use it to help make your pictures the best that they can be. So, if you have a DSLR, hopefully this class will give you an opportunity to play with it a little bit and explore how it can work for you as you're composing and framing your shots. If you don't have a DSLR, maybe you're panicked, but don't be. The vast majority of students who take this class do so using the camera on their smartphones. And the good news is that in this day and age, smartphone cameras are really good cameras. If you plan to use your phone, here are a couple of tips and tricks that will help. And I'd rather you use these than to rely on filters or apps that allow you to edit the images. Step one is to look for the light. You probably already know this, but phone cameras don't tend to do well in dim light. 
To get the best shots, look for opportunities where your phone sensor can shine. If you're indoors, try to set up your shot so that there's light falling on your subject. Window light is often really, really great. You could also take a light, like a desk light, and take the, the shade off and use that to kind of direct light towards your subject as well. Always try to find good light rather than relying upon the flash. The LED flash on most phones is underpowered and it often makes the photo quality much worse than it would otherwise be. Step number two is to adjust the exposure. Most phone camera apps let you have a little bit of control over the image, and the most basic adjustment that you can make is to the exposure, brightening or darkening a scene. If you use it effectively, you can turn a bland scene into a stunner. On different phones, the exposure is labeled differently. On iPhone, it's a sun, and if you tap it and kind of toggle it, you can, get, you can brighten or darken the scene. And on Androids, it tends to be a more traditional plus or minus icon. A third tip is to turn on your grid. Adding the grid lines will help you know that yours is a good composition. In the next lecture series in this module, we're going to talk about composition. But with the grid, you can keep your horizon straight, which helps with portraits and landscapes. And a fourth tip is to learn your camera's features. Depending upon your phone, you've got extras like burst, which is great for capturing movement, and portrait, which is good for capturing objects at close range. And finally, focus close. Your phone can usually focus really close, so you can capture objects at a close range and keep the whole frame in focus. So hopefully after this, you feel a little bit better about using your camera. In the next video, I'm gonna talk about the grammar and vocabulary of photography, the terms we use to describe what we're doing when we take a picture. And in the next lecture series, we're going to talk about composition, basically how to frame your shots so that they look good. Stay tuned.